Hello and welcome to Original Sound Chat, where video game music is a work of art. On each episode, it's our goal to help you learn about two soundtracks from the world of games, as well as the people, stories, and critical tracks behind them. My name is Joe DeVader. And I'm Peter Spasia. We're brought to you by Anonymous Dinosaur and Rhymes with Asia. It's time to appreciate great OSTs and the games they come from without getting too bogged down in music theory. Joe, what are this week's games? Up first is a mystical journey through sequin land with Jake Kaufman's work on Shantae and the Pirate's Curse. Following that is 2017's Cuphead, with enough big band jazz created off of zero composing experience to perfectly fuel a 1930s cartoon-inspired boss rush. So, my apologies for the, the still stuffiness, still fighting through a cold. It's been a rough week of podcasting. Plus, I'm about to leave on a business trip. So it's like, oh, I got a flight in the morning and we've got to try to fit in this podcast much later at night than we usually record. So it's just, yeah. just a, it's just a good time all around. How are you doing, Joe? I'm alive. I just got out of classes a couple hours ago. So I too am very tired. Like you said, a lot later than we usually do. Usually these are done like early evening. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's 11 p.m. where you are. Yeah, we're pushing into the next day. So, but for this week's games, uh, you know, certainly ones that focus on kind of more of a cartoon style, kind of more of a focus on the animation of the characters almost in, in a way. Uh, they're definitely platformer games, but very different goals to accomplish in, in these games, certainly. I have very, very little knowledge of your game, though. So I'm. Very interested to learn about it, though the composer I love. I am also a very big fan of the composer that I'm covering this week. He's probably actually my favorite Western composer that is currently working in the industry. Yeah, I, I know I mentioned uh, Austin Wintry, you know, a couple episodes ago, but like he's one A and one B here with with Jake Kaufman. I've got I've got Austin Wintry. I've got Jake Kaufman. I've got Laura Shigihara. Um, there's probably a couple more Darren Korb. Like I have, there are a lot of really, really good Western and, uh, composers. And a lot of them are working in the indie circuit. Not a lot of them don't usually move over into the AAA circuit. Like one Austin Wintory did, but let's jump into Shantae and the pirate's curse. Now Shantae, for anybody that does not know is actually a, surprisingly old franchise not like super retro but the first shantae game was a game boy color game uh it was released in 2002 and it didn't do great it's a good game i believe i haven't actually played it i've had it on my 3ds installed for three years and i've still yet to actually play it and one of these days i'm gonna fix that 2002 for a Game Boy Color game, that's like way late in its life cycle, though. That's one of the reasons they think it did not do well. Uh, it, it came out super, super late on the Game Boy Color's uh, life cycle and just sort of dropped into obscurity. And then about eight years later, Shantae Risky's Revenge came out which was a, a sequel that I am not a huge fan of. I've played a little bit of it, and I didn't enjoy what I played, but Shantae and the Pirate's Curse released for the 3DS in 2014. It is the third game in the Shantae series, and this game rules. It is so good. Uh, it is made by Way Forward, and after coming out on the 3DS in 2014, it would later be released on the Wii U. The PC, the Xbox One, the PS4, and of course, the Nintendo Switch. So if someone is new to the series like myself, and if, say, someone were looking for a new game to play on their Nintendo Switch, do you think this is an appropriate game to start with, with it, when it comes to this franchise? I mean, it's the one I started with. Okay. <laughs> so okay. This, was, this was the first Shantae game I ever played. Uh, outside of attempting to play the original Game Boy Color one once, and the method I was using didn't work, so I never ended up playing it. But uh, then I believe I got Pirate's Curse out of like a Humble Bundle. 
Mm-mm. And finally, finally gave it a shot. And uh, oh, I love it. I love this game. It's so good. And its soundtrack is incredible. If you don't know what Shantae is in general, uh, it is a game about a young half genie girl named Shantae, who is the protector of a place called Scuttletown. And in Pirate's Curse, she has lost her genie powers. I guess that that happens at the end of Risky's Revenge. It explains all this and catches the player up. Through the events of the beginning of the game, she is thrown into an adventure where she has to work alongside Risky Boots, her nemesis, to stop Risky Boots' old master, the Pirate Master, from reviving using dark magic. And that's the that's the plot. It's like a platforming game, primarily, right? It's a platformer, but it's also kind of a Metroidvania, where you're okay. you're getting abilities that will allow you... You can go back and revisit areas once you get new abilities, and they'll allow you to reach different parts of it, and that kind of thing. So it's a weird sort of hybrid of a Metroidvania and a just regular platformer. And, like, you attack enemies with, like, hair whips and stuff like that? Yep, she's got a hair whip, uh... She's got, in this specific game, she's got a lot of, like, pirate tools that she uses to to give her special abilities. Like, mm. she can get a cannon that will give her a double jump uh, while also shooting a projectile straight down. She's got, if she gets the sword, she'll basically get Samus's speed thing. She basically gets that. Uh, and much, much more. It's a really, really fun game, and I absolutely recommend it. I could not actually find a lot of information on the development of this game, if any, to be honest. And I kind of have a theory as to why. Uh, I feel like if I were doing Risky's Revenge, I'd be able to find some information. I feel like if I were doing Half Genie Hero, which I will eventually, uh, I would be able to find information because Risky's Revenge was a revival. Meanwhile... Half Genie Hero was a Kickstarter success and a very high profile one at that. But Pirate's Curse is just sort of the game in the middle of those two things. I think it's the best Shantae game, but I'm not surprised I couldn't find a lot of information on the development, if that makes sense. Interesting. Uh, it got very generally good reception. Same with Risky's Revenge. The whole series has generally hovered around like an 85% on Metacritic and in general with reviewers. Some of the reviewers that I saw sort of criticized its movement from a big open world to smaller self-contained islands. But I think that that was a good idea. And there were also a good amount of, uh, a good amount of reviewers that agreed with me (laughs) because a lot of reviewers brought up something I think makes sense is because having all of these separate islands lets them Sure, there's not as much exploration, but it allowed them to really, like, fine-tune the design and make it a little bit more full-fleshed out, I guess. Because when you have smaller areas to work with, those areas become better because you have less that you have to work with. You're juggling fewer jobs. Mm -hmm. Later, it would get a sequel called Shantae Half Genie Hero, which was, again, a big Kickstarter success and a game that I will be bringing eventually. And Shantae 5 just got announced, like, Two weeks ago. It sure did. So, that's cool. Uh, And, Shantae has just sort of become this pseudo-Nintendo retro property? Nintendo doesn't own Shantae, obviously. They have no stake in Shantae whatsoever. They don't own WayForward or anything. But Shantae has shown up in a WarioWare game. She was in WarioWare DIY. Uh, And she also... There is a Shantae and a Risky Boots spirit in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, which I found super cool and mm-hmm. also kind of weird. Yeah, there's definitely a contingent that wants her in Smash Brothers, but... I would love to have her in Smash. But yeah, I mean, Shantae 5, I mean, it's going to be pretty much everywhere, even on Apple Arcade, of all things, oh, which yeah. is really interesting. So yeah, it's, it, it's really interesting to know. Like, I had never known really of the order of the games, but it's interesting. You know, Shantae, Risky's Revenge... Pirate's Curse, Half Genie Hero, and now Five. It's not gonna it's not gonna stay Shantae Five. It'll get a name, but that's really interesting to know. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh it's a very interesting series, and I think Shantae is a very underrated protagonist. Uh all things considered. She's a very underrated sort of mascot character. 
And I'm glad that she was able to make a comeback, even if it took eight years to crawl her way out of relative obscurity. Mm -hmm. But all of the music, not just for Pirate's Curse, but for the entire series, and this includes the 2002 Game Boy game, was done by Jake Kaufman. Yeah. Jake Kaufman was born on April 3rd, 1981. Uh, And then... It didn't really have a lot of information. I wasn't able to find a huge amount of information on his early life with music, but it did mention that he he is a high school dropout. He dropped out because of, quote, and this is a quote from him, a total lack of work ethic and no concept of timeliness or organization. And boy, if that's not what the kids would call a mood. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he, dro- he dropped out of high school, and then as a hobby, he started doing video game remixes. And he began to get a huge following with that, uh, going under the name Vert. Now, quick fun fact. I was aware for a long time of the names Vert and Jake Kaufman, and I swear to God, until Shovel Knight, I didn't put two and two together that they were the same human being. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's really interesting, like, because I haven't, you know, spent as much time in, like, the OC remix. So, like... I knew of Jake Kaufman and then everyone's like, oh yeah, he's Vert. And I'm like, cool. That doesn't mean as much to me, but it's, it's neat that he has this whole kind of background to it all. I had the exact opposite reaction of, mm. yeah, Jake Kaufman's pretty cool. He did the music for, for DuckTales Remastered. That's pretty cool. Oh, that's Vert. Oh, okay. Cause I'm pretty sure I had Vert remixes on my iPod at that point. So. I had heard his music before, just didn't realize that it was that. See, he does really cool things with like, you know, the that one video gamer with you know, big bad bosses and he does the, like the music for that. But Jake Kaufman also does like one of my favorite video game remixes ever. And if anyone knows of the impresario, yeah. which is the take on the Final Fantasy VI opera, it's like one of the greatest video game music remix pieces i think ever and it's oh, like 100 percent. it's like taking that opera scene and putting it to a rock opera and it's just uh, just fantastic and so i mean that's where not it's not where i first learned of him but like really really became a fan of his i think that was the first place that i ever saw the name jake kaufman because i would have heard that again before i even realized oh he and Vert are the same human Fun fact for you there. My past self was a dumb idiot. Uh, <laughs> he he gained, like I said, quite a following under the name Vert. And he even, in 2002, set up his own video game remix site called VG Mix. He's one of the co-founders of that website, which I'm not super familiar with it. Because I, I was always like an OC remix and a Dwelling of Duels guy when it came to finding game remixes. But uh, perusing it a little bit today... It's a pretty cool website, and it seems to have SoundCloud integration, which I don't believe OC Remix even has. Hmm. This boy has been in official video game composition for longer than I thought. His first composing job for a video game was in 2000 for the Game Boy port of Qbert. And by 2005, he was working freelance as a freelance game composer full-time. He was basically freelance until I think 2009 was what it was saying, where he got a job at Volition because he was working on their game uh, Red Faction Guerrilla. But then in 2010, he left Volition and joined Way Forward, which is where he did a majority of the games he is now known for. Mm -hmm. Fun fact that I found very heartwarming while reading this. I'm so excited to bring this up. Working for Way Forward or with Way Forward, because at least one of these games was done before he was an official employee of theirs, he was able to complete two of his lifelong dreams. One being to compose for a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, which he did, Danger of the Ooze. It was one of his last two games at Way Forward. And a Contra game, which he did. He did the music for Contra 4. Good for him. That's awesome. I love that. Like, I guess he cited both of those as, like, life dreams of his, and then he got to do it. He got to do them. That's so cool. Uh, He has since left Way Forward. He left in 2014. 
Uh, his last two games with them were, were again, Danger Ninja Turtles, Dangerous of the Use, and Shantae Half Genie Hero. Uh, according to him, he left on good terms, so I'm really hoping that he is coming back for Shantae 5. It sounds like he probably would be super down for it. I mean, if he's done all the others, you'd think that'd be almost a given. It's, it's that definitive style for the game, yeah. I would hope so. In 2015, he took part in a Kickstarter campaign for a thing called Nuren, the New Renaissance, which was self-described as the world's first virtual reality rock opera. I had never heard of this before now. It was originally planned to come out in 2016, but got super delayed because, like most Kickstarters, it ended up being way more work than the people working on it and like figured it would be. And I guess he currently does uh, bi-weekly development sessions of it on Twitch. And that is the entirety of, of Jake Kaufman information that I was able to find that has to do with his history. His discography, however, might be one of the longest discographies we've covered so far. <laughs> He's had a career. His discography includes, again, his first game was Cubert on the Game Boy Color. He has done a ton of shovelware and branded games, especially at the beginning of his career, including, just to name a few, M&M's Minis Madness, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, Micro Machines, and Rugrats I Gotta Go Party. Yes, I included that last one, because if I have to know that's a title of a video game, so do you. I mean, it's like the fractured but whole, but worse. But like a Rugrats game. <laughs> Uh, he, again, he has done all of the music for the Shantae franchise, including the original Game Boy game. He did the music for Legend of K, which is not a game I have played, but is a game I have heard of. Uh, Contra 4, Red Faction Guerrilla, Blood Rain Betrayal, Mighty Switch Force, Retro City Rampage, Double Dragon Neon, DuckTales Remastered, Shovel Knight, which yeah. is probably his most famous soundtrack. Yes. Which, that's, that's coming to the show eventually, believe you me. So here's the thing, if, if King's Knight, if uh, King of Cards was going to be hitting its original release date, it was, it was planned right there, and I would have loved to talk about Jake Kaufman with that game, but we'll, we'll figure that out when we get back to the second go-around for, uh, <laughs> for certain composers and how that works out. Double Dragon Neon is another baller soundtrack. I mean, it's, it's so good. So that's not one I'm familiar with. Uh, I, f I should have figured he was probably involved with that. I forgot Way Forward made it. Mm -hmm. And he is contributing either currently or has finished contributing to the soundtrack for Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. Oh, that game better be coming out this year. <laughs> I certainly hope so. It looks super good. Please let it actually be good. Don't mighty number nine this. I'm begging you, Igarashi. I don't even have any stake in this. I've never played Symphony of the Night. <laughs> I've been holding on to that Kickstarter for a long time. <laughs> Again, I couldn't find much historical stuff for this soundtrack itself, but I did find two quotes that I really like from Jake Kaufman. The first being that he loves working on Shantae and would, quote, totally love to work on at least 100 to 150 more sequels to Shantae. <laughs> so that makes me pretty hopeful he's coming back for, for Shantae 5. The dude sounds like he absolutely adores working with this franchise. It's it's his baby in a way. He's not making the games, but like, I think I was reading somewhere that when Risky's Revenge was being made, him and one other guy were the only people on the entire team that had worked on the original Shantae. Wow. So like, he it's a it's a dynasty thing at this point. Is dynasty the word? I don't think dynasty is the word, but you get what I'm legacy. going for. Legacy. Legacy. That's yeah. The, it's a legacy thing at this point. He's done them all, so he might as well come back for five. Uh, and another quote I found that I just really, really liked, uh, just about his general work in video games in general, is, quote, Life is short, and I want to spend as much time as possible laughing like an idiot and making others laugh like idiots and headbang like they mean it. That's what drives me. And I thought that was a good quote. Good man, good man. I, I think one of the things I admire about Jake Kaufman, and I hope what our listeners kind of glean from these songs as kind of a, a sample set is that we've talked about in the past on how with retro soundtracks, they only have so many tracks to work with. And so the melody line is so important to really have the track stand out and be memorable. 
And for Jake Kaufman's work, it's like ratcheting that up to 11 because the technology allows for so much now, but still that importance of melody is there. And maybe it's because mostly of the kinds of games he's working on that are kind of retro inspired in a way. So it's Mm -hmm. kind of like borrowing from that. But the tenant still holds where so many of these are, are so catchy and it's because there's a really heavy emphasis placed on the melody. Yeah, he definitely works like an old school games composer, 100%. You can even hear it in, I'm pretty sure some of Half GD Hero was at least partially orchestrated. I don't think the whole thing was even slightly. I'm pretty sure it's still a lot of MIDI. Mm -hmm. But like you can even still hear it there, which that is also a very good game if somebody's looking for a, a game to play. That's a very good game, too. But yeah, this whole soundtrack just sort of has an Arabian feeling to it, while also just sort of keeping this this simplicity. I think that's really what it comes down to. They're not complex pieces, and yeah, like you said, it's all about the melody. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very cool. But let's jump into five critical tracks so we can really talk about this Arabian flair. And we're going to start with... One of my favorite songs in the game, and probably the one you hear the most often in the whole game, Scuttletown. So this plays in Scuttletown, which is basically the hub town of the game. It's where all of Shantae's friends live. It's the place that she's supposed to be the guardian of. And this song is so catchy and it's the heavy beat that does it for me a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, and if you play the game and you look at like Shantae's idol stance while you're standing in this, in this area, her I'm pretty sure, and I don't know if this is actually the case or if I made it up in my head and just like made myself see it, I'm pretty sure her idle stance syncs up with the song. Like every time there's a beat, she's like bringing her arms out and in and out and in. It's so cool. I wish more games did that. This is the Shantae song, in my opinion. This song does show up in other games in the series. I think this is the best version of it by far. Half Genie Hero's version is also very good, but not nearly as good as this one because it it has more of a subdued beat to it. And I think that takes away from some of it. But this is absolutely one of my favorite songs in the game. Oh man, just that that beat just makes you want to bounce up and down and move back and forth. It makes you want to dance, man. It's good to know with, you know, no knowledge of this series that like this is quote unquote the song for the franchise in a way so it's good for some context there yeah you definitely hear some of the sort of the arabian inspiration kind of that this game sort of caters to uh but yeah it's good to know that context for this one in particular after that we have we love burning town Which not only is a great name. Sure is, yeah. <laughs> this is the one of the first songs you hear in the game in general. It's the song that plays during the intro level, I believe. Where Scuttletown is being attacked by a villain known as the Ammo Baron. Because the Ammo Baron has bought the town from the mayor. The mayor of Scuttletown sold him Scuttletown, and now he owns it, and he's just gonna blow it up. Uh, This song is so good. It's so bouncy. It's just a fun piece. And I think it really really drives home. I talk a lot about, like, 
This song is one of the first ones you hear, and it really drives home what kind of experience you're about to have. And I think that's something I can say about this song, too. Because it's just, especially right at the beginning with the dun 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 It's fun. It's just a fun piece. And I believe this song also shows up in Half Genie Hero. I'm not sure if it's in Risky's Revenge. Hmm. But again, I like this version way better than the Half Genie Hero version. After that, we have Roddy Tops. Which is the uh, main theme of the best character in Shantae, being Roddy Tops. Roddy Tops is a zombie girl who I believe is a villain in... She works for Risky Boots in Risky's Revenge. But in Pirate's Curse, she is just living with her two brothers on a haunted island. And pretty sure she has a thing for Shantae. I mean, who doesn't? (laughs) Pretty sure. Uh, She is... The best character in the game. She's super laid back. She's very relaxed. And her theme just absolutely nails that while also having this sort of... She's got a a bubbly sort of personality. She's always cheerful. And the song manages to, to capture both of those sort of dynamics of hers. And again, this is another sort of situation where when you go talk to her and this theme is playing, her idol stance syncs up with the beat. Which is one of the reasons why I'm pretty sure I'm not making up the Scuttletown thing. That's just good game design. Yeah, again, like, more games need to do that. It's so cool. This is a character I've always seen the design for, but Mm -hmm. would have never put the name Roddy Tops (laughs) to. She's she's so fun. There's a whole level in the game where you, uh, she, like, hurts herself and you have to, to pick her up and run her through this obstacle course. In probably one of the more famous levels of the game, mainly because speedrunners hate it. Uh, um, once you get to the end and you set her down, she's like, oh, by the way, nothing was wrong with me. I just wanted you to pick me up. I just wanted Shantae <laughs> to hold me. It's so good. Roddy Tops is great, and her theme is really good. And again, and I feel like I sound like a broken record now. I swear, Half Genie Hero has a very, very good soundtrack. But I like this version of Roddy Top's theme way better. The Half Genie Hero version is very... It goes a little too far on the subdued route. Hmm. And it's a lot quieter and there's not really a, a lot of, like, beat to it. After that, we have Scorching Dunes, Sunburn Island. which is the song for when you first get to the desert level, which I know what you're thinking. It's an Arabian-themed game, and there's only one desert level? And yes, yes, there is. And it's really cool. (laughs) And the song that plays during it is also extremely good. I think it's the... it's the plucking. I think it's a mandolin or a sitar? I don't know a lot about that part of the world's instrument set something like that yeah but that's that's what i'm assuming it is either way it's really cool this song has a really good desert feel to it and it's mainly on this list because i really like it what more reason do you need you know what it kind of makes me think of is uh agrabah from kingdom hearts 2 yeah a little (laughs) bit (laughs) a little bit a little bit i i can hear it i can hear it I just really like this song, and I really like this level, and throughout the years, because I played Pirate's Curse on a 3DS, like, three, four years ago? It was before Half Genie Hero came out, like, a year and a half before Half Genie Hero came out, at least. 
And this song still is, like, it stuck with me. So, had to include it. And last but not least, the boss battle theme. So when I knew that Jake Kaufman did this soundtrack, but I've never heard any songs from it. And so when I look over a track list for Shantae and the Pirate's Curse and I see Boss Battle, and I'm like, I got to imagine what does a Jake Kaufman Boss Battle theme <laughs> sound like? And I click on it, I'm like, yep, that rules. That's exactly what I had want it to be. <laughs> It's so good. Like, so I wrote in the in the outline, and I really do believe this, that games like Shantae, and there's a couple other franchises like this, they live or die by their boss fights and the theme that plays during them. And sometimes a good boss fight can be kind of ruined by a bad theme, case in point, and this is going to a different game. In Castlevania Rondo of Blood, there's a really cool boss fight that is a sort of gauntlet of all of the original Castlevania 1 bosses. Mm. And it plays the original Castlevania theme, boss theme, remixed obviously, but it plays the original Castlevania boss theme. And that song sucks. Mm. <laughs> that song's not very good. So, and it, it kind of ruins that boss fight just a little bit. This game doesn't have that problem. Shantae and the Pirate's Curse's boss battle theme is so good. It's really intense. And like you said, it's it's a Jake Kaufman boss theme through and through. It's exactly what you want it to be. And obviously, this isn't the first Jake Kaufman boss theme I ever heard. I played Shovel Knight before I played Shantae. And that game also has a fantastic boss theme. but Or boss themes, I guess. All of the bosses have their own themes <laughs> yeah, in, in yeah. Shovel Knight even. Mm -hmm. But like, this this game doesn't have different themes for boss individual bosses it's just this is the song that plays and i never got tired of it ever but that's all i got to say about these five critical tracks i love the soundtrack this is probably if shovel knight didn't exist this would be my favorite jake kaufman soundtrack by far mm -hmm. uh not that i have a huge amount of jake kaufman soundtracks i listen to on the regular but i have quite a but i have a few and this is definitely a very close second to Shovel Knight itself. Cutting Room Floor has two songs. First one being The Nightmare Woods, Run Run Roddy Tops. It's the song that plays during that level I told you about when I was talking about Roddy Tops, where mm. you carry her through an obstacle course. It's a very, very good song. And Trip Through Sequin Land. Which I don't consider to be an incredible song, but I like this song. It's one of my favorites on the soundtrack. It's up there. I just didn't consider it like a critical track worthy thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. It's a good song. So what will I never forget about Shantae and the Pirate's Curse? The writing and the characters are super good. Sprite work is phenomenal. Gameplay feels fantastic. And of course, the soundtrack is incredible. This is one of those games where, uh, in order to get the quote unquote true ending, you have to go get all of the collectibles in the, in the worlds. And I'm not usually one to do that. I did that with Shantae and the Pirate's Curse. Mm -hmm. So 
I, I really like this game. This game basically turned me into a Shantae fan for life. Shantae 5 would have to be abysmal in order to turn me off from the franchise. It, it made a fan out of me. So that's what I will never forget. Well, I am super tempted now to go buy it for Nintendo Switch for the, uh, the business trip I'm about to take. So This and Half Genie Hero, absolutely worth your money, 100%. Uh, Half Genie Hero is closer to being a straight platformer. Than a, than a Metroidvania. It's weird, because they're almost all, like, completely different genres, almost. I don't know. Oh, don't, don't get me wrong. I love Metroidvanias. Like, that's not a turnoff at all. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Both are, both are very good. It's just both feel very differently, different as games. Hmm. So, for the transition, we usually like to highlight a fan cover or something off of OC Remix or something like that. Mine comes off of YouTube. It was actually surprisingly difficult to find something. But I did find something that I ended up really liking, and that is a, a remix of Run Run Roddy Top, specifically what is described as Intense Symphonic Metal Cover by YouTuber Falcone, spelled F-A-L-K-K-O-N-E. It was uh, very good, so hey, enjoy that. And now for something similar, but also still entirely different. Cuphead. Yeah! Cuphead is relevant because uh, the game comes out this week on Nintendo Switch. So like that's, that's a big deal. Uh, but it was originally first released for Xbox One and PC on September 29th, 2017. But yeah, April 18th, 2019, it finally comes to Nintendo Switch. Cuphead was developed and published by Studio MDHR. And so it's directed and kind of the vision is led by brothers Chad and Jared Moldenhauer. And so when you think Studio MDHR, that's for Moldenhauer. So, uh, cle <laughs> clever brothers there. Uh, Chad handles the art design for the game, whereas Jared handles more of the game design. And so the gist of what Cuphead is, is there are some levels of run and gun platforming, but most of this game involves battling difficult bosses with 2D shooting involved. And so it's, it's almost not really a boss gauntlet per se, but just a lot of bosses. Uh, and they're very, very difficult, so they take a lot of trial and error. Uh, the development originally started with three people on the team, but it expanded to 14 uh, upon adding you know, more bosses, more levels, just expanding the team's original vision. On Studio MDHR's website, on their About section, they currently have 17 people credited to their team. So hmm. to get the gist of the plot uh, of Cuphead, uh, let's have the... Barbershop quartet known as Shoptimus Prime tell you in this opening song. Well, Cuphead and his pal mug man, they like to roll the dice. By chance they came upon Devil's Game, and gosh, they paid the price. Paid the price. And now they're fighting for their lives on a mission fraught with dread. And if they proceed but don't succeed, well, the devil will take their heads. So this is a song that kind of opens and then the title screen goes to a piano version of this song. But it's it's a great way to kind of set the stage, get you in this sort of mood because everything is supposed to emulate a style of a 1930s cartoon, which is so unique and different. I, there are hardly any other games that look like it, uh, much less you know play like it on top of it. But the game's art style 
Uh, it's really definitely inspired by the Fleischer and Walt Disney Animation Studios of the 1930s, really especially Fleischer there. And so the Moldenhauers sought to mimic their subversive and surrealist elements. But this comes at a time of rubber hose animation, which is a term that's really attributed to how the character limbs act. They're just all kind of loosey-goosey in, in that sense. So the Moldenhauers were big fans of this kind of cartoon style going back in their youth. And so they wanted to try to create a game like this in around 2000, uh, but they kind of lacked the tools to do so. Though after seeing the indie success of Super Meat Boy, which we mentioned on a past episode, they kind of started thinking about that again in 2010. And then in 2012, development really kind of picked up. All of the animation in this game is done by hand, which is just absolutely nuts. Uh, some estimates have it at over 120,000, or at least more than that, more than 120,000 frames of hand-drawn animation with pencil on a light board. Somebody that put it really, really well, I think, when the game first came out, uh, Video Game Donkey did a video on it, and he opens it with, like, here's these awful uh, animations that I used to do. So, like, when I tell you that they put so much work into Cuphead's animation, and then he goes through how many frames are in one boss's idol's animation. Mm -hmm. And it's insane! For one boss, it's like, it can be like around 1,300 frames just for like an entire boss battle. It's it's insane. Uh, because the gameplay runs at 60 frames per second, but yet the animation is 24 frames per second for that kind of classic filmic look. Uh, the backgrounds of the levels were painted with watercolor, but the characters were colorized in Photoshop which made it much easier for them because they were testing different kinds of paints and styles and whatnot, and it didn't look too different than Photoshop. So at least Photoshop could streamline their process for each and every one. They could just kind of colorize it there. So at least that made it slightly easier for them. Uh, but the Moldenhauers were certainly a case of the indie dream and sacrificing everything and, and banking all of their hopes on the game's success because each of them remortgaged their houses during development in order to finance the project and also to work on it full time. And gotta stress, like this should not be used as a template for indie success. It could have backfired so terribly. Even they've said that, haven't they? I'm pre you know, pretty sure. I mean, they, they'd be smart to say so. Or like even... They were, I'm pretty sure they've they've straight out come and said, like, if this game hadn't been a success, like a crazy, crazy success, we just threw, like, our lives in the toilet. Oh, oh for sure. Yeah. Don't do this at home, kids. Don't don't make Cuphead at home. I, I believe they've also come out and said, like, we are really proud of how Cuphead turned out, and we're really happy with the success and how the game ended up when it shipped. If we had known how much work making this game was going to be, we wouldn't have done it. <laughs> oh, for sure. But, you know, the passion carries over and it shows, certainly. So the game was originally revealed at E3 2014 with a, there was an ID at Xbox montage in Microsoft's conference. And it was planned for release in 2015. It got its own trailer presence at E3 2015, also at the Microsoft conference. Uh, but when it was playable on the show floor, it faced critical feedback, especially for like the run and gun levels. So it kind of went away for a little while and then it, you know, they were, they were tinkering on it and working on it. Finally showed again at E3 2017. Uh, a lot of people were big on it. Released later that fall and it's, and, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. The game is generally seen as tough but fair. And during its launch, it found itself in a bit of controversy with Game journalist Dean Takahashi of Venture Beat, who struggled with the tutorial level, and it brought up a whole thing of how good at video games do game journalists have to be, and there's a whole sort of uh, jealousy element that can 
play in there. And uh, it, it was a whole thing at the time, but it was just odd to see this this little game Cuphead kind of at the center of that. I remember that, and I remember it being really stupid. It absolutely was stupid, yeah. But also, man, you should have just gone and grabbed somebody to do the tutorial level for <laughs> you, bro. Yeah. If you couldn't do it. But yeah, the, just the critiques of that is just way more harsh than they needed to be. That that was a whole whole thing, if you remember those days. I mean, gosh, it was only almost you know, less than two years ago. I remember that and the Doom thing. Those were the two things. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, the game was definitely critically well-received, though. There's an average of about 87 on Metacritic. Uh, to date, or at least as of August 2018, it sold over 3 million copies. There was 1 million copies sold in the first two weeks, and by the end of its opening weekend, it was already profitable. So, yes. yeah, a, a, just a raving success, and all that hard work paid off. But again, yes, should not be the template. Don't mortgage your houses. D- don't do that. Just it's it's not smart. So it, it should be. It's sh- like let me really take this in. Cuphead got got successful because of blind luck. Yes, its unique look and all that helped a lot. Indie games get big because of blind luck. Do not mortgage your house on the hope that you will have the blind luck that causes your game to become a massive runaway hit. Because nine times out of ten, it's not gonna happen. It's just not the smartest thing to do. But yes, Cuphead certainly was a runaway success. It was an award-winning success. Oh, and it deserved it so much. I haven't played it, and I just, it deserves it so much. <laughs> so, here's the thing. I own it. I've tried to play it, but it's the I'm bad at video games thing. I, I got past the tutorial level, don't get me wrong. But it was a few <laughs> bosses in where it's just like, oof, like I am not good at this kind of game. And so I put it down and I just haven't gotten back to it. I really want to play it co-op. Uh, my roommate also wants to play it co-op. But the thing is, like, I don't have an Xbox, so that was out. And playing couch co-op games on PC, in my opinion is more trouble than it's worth. So it coming to Switch, literally the best thing that could be happening. Oh, I mean, that'll be absolutely perfect for that then, for sure. Uh, yeah, it's just one where, like, the announcement came up and we're like, well, we got to move whatever we're talking about for this week because we got to talk about Cuphead because its <laughs> soundtrack is just incredible. Uh, you know, Cuphead is just an award-winning game overall. It won Best Art Direction, Best Independent Game, Best debut indie game at the game awards 2017 it was also nominated for best action game and also for best score slash music and get a load of this category all right we talked about near automata that's what won this category that year of course cuphead was nominated but persona 5 super mario odyssey the legend of zelda breath of the wild destiny 2 like that's a juggernaut soundtrack category very much so. 100%. It's just just crazy. Uh, but Cuphead's story is not done because there is DLC being worked on. So even more animation, even more songs being created for Cuphead. The DLC is called The Delicious Last Course. It'll feature a new playable Miss Chalice character. But a new island, so new levels, bosses. This was revealed at E3 2018. It's still expected for release this year, but... They have not determined a date yet. When it comes to that fantastic soundtrack for Cuphead, it's all the work of one Christopher Madigan. And so Christopher Madigan, I don't know why with him and the Mollenhauers, like there's no word on like when they were born, what year they were born. If I looked at pictures, I would guess they're in their maybe later 30s. Like, because they're they're still pretty young, uh, but it's it's hard to tell because I don't know if it's just the the secrecy of you know trying to not have that online. Just very interesting there. But Christopher Madigan grew up in Regina, Saskatchewan, uh, and he's currently based in Toronto. Uh, he started on piano as a child, and he didn't really have the patience for it. We kind of see that. Quite a bit as we you know talk about like the early history of different composers. It's always piano too. Well, piano's a good kind of fundamental thing to start on. I mean, I learned on piano. Yeah, I didn't. I wish I did. 
<laughs> but Christopher Madigan wanted to be a rock drummer as a kid. And so it was a compromise with his mother to take classical percussion lessons at age 10. Now, as he grew up, certainly throughout his years at school, uh, he would play the drums, especially in rock bands. But Madigan is now known as the principal percussionist with the National Ballet of Canada Orchestra, and he performs with plenty of other Canadian groups. Uh, but he's just known as this percussionist, this drummer, and that he's a musician by trade. But he's also known Chad and Jared Moldenhauer since the fifth grade, and they grew up a couple blocks apart and, you know, played video games together and all that. So when the Moldenhauers were looking for someone to create the music for their game, they thought of Christopher Madigan. And, you know, he's like, well, I, I, I perform music, but I mean, uh, composing music for a video game? Like, no way, that sounds too daunting. He literally said, eventually when he accepted and, you know, tried to create some music, he literally said, I literally had no idea what I was doing when I started. So this is someone who has no experience in composing music, but... His friends really want him to compose the music for their game project. Yes, he plays music. He knows you know, about music uh, by, by playing and you know, rhythm and, and, and meter and all that. But composing for instruments and key, like, what is this? He, Madigan said that this was a benefit, though, in a way, because he wasn't bound by any rules that they teach in school. But reading different interviews, it was interesting to see him kind of give advice on how to start out and learn how to compose a game soundtrack. Uh, one of his pieces of advice, he said his kind of process was listening, reading, listening, studying, listening, working on theory, score study, finding a great private teacher, listening. Uh <laughs> If there were any books that he would recommend reading, uh, he noted A Composer's Guide to Game Music by Winifred Phillips, and also Andrew Sharpman's Koji Kondo's Super Mario Brothers soundtrack, which is part of this 33 and 3rd series. So kind of reading those and just learning and listening and just studying overall. But he found John Herberman as a mentor and conductor. And so in some of these behind-the-scenes videos on... Uh, Studio MDHR's YouTube channel, that would be John Herbman conducting. So yeah, Christopher Madigan's discography is pretty limited because Cuphead is the only game he has composed for. Uh, but he did a few episodes of the TV series Kozakfeld and Level Up Norge, which that, sure. that's, that's news <laughs> to me. He said like, only a few episodes here and there, at least that's according to IMDB. but. Yeah, he, he plays music primarily, but not so much on the composition side. When it comes to the history of Cuphead's soundtrack specifically, the driving vision was 1930s big band. And, and yes, when you hear the songs, absolutely hits that mark 100%. Nailed it. Yeah, for sure. But it's it's different than what were seen as like the playful orchestral scores at the time for 1930s cartoons. It ended up being all told about three hours of music with 51 compositions. And all of this music is live performed by musicians, like no reliance on MIDI stuff. They wanted to capture the actual feel of what it'd be like to have musicians perform like almost like in 1930s sort of style but it's 40 different barbershop, big band, and jazz musicians all contributing to playing the instruments on this soundtrack. Now, when it comes to jazz inspirations, Duke Ellington and Scott Joplin were Madigan's biggest inspirations, but you definitely see Cab Calloway, Benny Goodman, Gene Krupa, and Fletcher Henderson casting long shadows, as it were, on the game's music. Now, Madigan was brought into this project in late summer 2013, and of course he was certainly very hesitant about it because he had never done anything like this before, especially when, you know, the Moldenhauers, their vision at the time 
was eight to ten bosses max. <laughs> Well, this definitely changed uh, because at the time of Cuphead's launch, there were 19 bosses. And that's if you don't count some of the mini bosses in the the penultimate level. He got swindled. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, at at the end of it. I mean, but at the time, I guess, you know, maybe when the plans expanded, the Molden Howers wanted to break the Guinness record of, like, bosses in a game, which is apparently 25. They wanted, like, 30 at one point. Oh, God. I'm sure with all the animation, that was probably part of, let's not do that many. Maybe maybe no. So it was also interesting to see some of the -the behind-the-scenes videos, like I mentioned on Studio MDHR's uh, YouTube channel, because a lot of these tracks, seemingly, were not recorded without percussion. And so that must have been a challenge for the conductor to kind of keep the tempo and for the musicians to keep up and to stick together without a drummer playing in the background. Not sure if it was Madigan doing the percussion himself. I mean, it very well could have been. I would imagine it it would be. Uh, But that would have been done separately. And to try to almost keep pace with that sounds like more of a challenge that way. But yeah, they're in these, these kind of studio recording rooms and like they're just playing with the instruments together it's it's very interesting in that sense because the music is not easy at all i mean it's jazz it's it's difficult there are are solos there is real artistry going on but the musicians really rose the challenge and just delivered exceptional performances more awards that this game won for its soundtrack in particular were a bafta for best game music and an academy of interactive arts and science dice award for Outstanding Achievement in Original Music. In fact, Madigan himself was also nominated for a Juno Award, which is essentially Canada's Grammys, for Best Instrumental Album of the Year. So when we talk about, you know, Journey being nominated for a Grammy, uh, for a game soundtrack, well, Cuphead was nominated for a, a, a Canada Grammy, in a way, for a Juno Award. So, like, we're talking, you know, just premium level stuff it's just so so good if you're curious what madigan's favorite song from the soundtrack is he says it's pyramid peril It's fine. It's just not one I'd put on the critical tracks, as we'll soon see. But the development team got a lot of messages, apparently, saying that this was players' first exposure to jazz music, which one I find just unbelievable. That's impossible. Exactly, no. right? <laughs> no, it wasn't. But for those that did, I mean, that, that's got to be really gratifying to the, the development team, because, like, what a way to experience this as supposedly the first jazz experience like it's it's such a good soundtrack let's get into those five critical tracks we got to start with one of the earlier boss levels and it's it's a simple track but it really really catches on it's botanic panic So this is for the root pack, which is comprised of Mo Tato, Weepy, and Psy Carrot. Uh, they're the bosses of Botanic Panic on Inkwell Isle One. And again, like it's it's a simple sort of melody arpeggio that kind of repeats and builds on itself, but you kind of get the sense of like an early. Like the, it's a pretty simple boss, but at the same time, the music is kind of simple to go along with it. But you really get the sense of, like, what this soundtrack is going to be like when you're facing these bosses. I mean, you're going to get drums that really drive the pace. You're going to get, you know, some support, whether it's with saxes or or lower brass. And you're going to get, whether it's trumpets or saxophones, like, really driving the melody. It's 
It's a it's a very catchy song too. The drum part specifically, like when you bring up that this music was recorded without a percussionist in the room, that's insane. No. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How? How? <laughs> it's it's wild to think so, uh, because one of the videos, the behind the scenes videos that they show this for is for our next song on the critical tracks, Floral Fury. <laughs> something that's it's pretty different uh, this is for the Cagney Carnation boss which is part of the Floral Fury level on Inkwell Isle 1 now this doesn't really use that 30s style jazz ragtime big band instead it kind of goes for more of a samba style which I guess at the time of development Madigan had like an interest especially in Brazilian percussion so I think that's probably some of this influence kind of coming in there but it really stands out because it's just a different style. And uh, this is really one of the first challenging bosses that players come across. I think this actually may have been the boss that broke me, to be honest, <laughs> uh, when I played. Uh, but still, like, get ready to hear this song a lot. And I think I even heard that uh, because of how many times players are going to be playing this song, like there are certain mixes of these songs where... Certain instruments can be louder or, you know, some you know, kind of get play a little more subdued or certain solos get played in, in different orders to try to mix things up a little bit because you're playing these levels over and over and over again with the trial and error. So the music kind of mixes itself up a little bit so it doesn't get too repetitive, which is very interesting, very jazz like because no two performances in jazz are exactly the same. See, I didn't know that. I had no idea that was a thing. That's a really good idea. <laughs> but I, it goes back to that whole Austin Wintry thing of like, of kind of just, just sort of moments in games and your, the cues, essentially. And it makes, mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah. Well, it also just like, like you said, you're going to be hearing, you're going to be playing the same level over and over and over again. Like imagine, I've used this example before, but in Pokemon Gen 2, you hear that, that wild Pokemon battle theme so many times. And then he hit Kanto, and there's a new wild Pokemon battle theme, and it's like, ah, oh, this is the best day of my life. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> and, like, imagine that, but with, with the wild Pokemon battle playing every 30 seconds, mm-hmm. because you are fighting the same wild Pokemon over and over again, and that's the whole game. And that's kind of what, not really, but you get what are, you get where I'm going. Yeah. So, like, a very creative way of doing that yeah that's really cool i didn't know that was a feature in the game that's neat so yeah keep an eye out for that when you get to play that on switch it's it's a very interesting one but yeah this song is just totally different than all the other boss battles oh yeah and it's a completely different feel but it really stands out in a very good way it's one of the more notable songs for sure next let's talk about carnival kerfuffle This is for the Beppy the Clown boss battle. He's the boss of Carnival Kerfuffle on Inkwell Isle 2. It's kind of like a bumper car, roller coaster, sort of carousel theme battle. Man, this is big band swing to an absolute T. The sax work in this is just sublime. And as a former alto sax player myself, I absolutely love it. This is probably among my favorite songs in the game just in general because yeah i i am a very big fan of swing music i don't seek it out because why would i seek out things that bring me happiness but (laughs) i really really like 
just things with a swing feel to them. And like I said, this is big band swing music to a T, baby. It sounds great. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you pick it up right after that that drum sort of intro fill and that sax melody right at the beginning. It's like, yes, yeah, like this is what big band swing needs to sound like. I I'm in love with it. It's it's so good. It had to be here in the five. But another one that has to be here in the five. We gotta go with Die House. I'm Mr. King Dice. I'm the gamest in the land. I never play nice. I'm the devil's right hand man. I can't let you pass, cause you ain't done everything. Bring me those contracts, come on, bring them to the king. If you haven't finished your task, haven't worked assiduously. Oh yeah, this song is so good and the vocalist is so good and ha. It's, it's just amazing. The context of this song in games is that there's like a dice shaped almost like transition portal in a way between islands where King Dice, the the right hand man of uh, the devil, is sort of allowing you passage to the next island. Like checking in, do you have have enough contracts? I can can let you pass. This song is sung by Alana Bridgewater. Yes, it is sung by a woman. Thank you for noticing. (laughs) What? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a woman singing. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. Damn, lady, you are talented. So it's even cooler to see her performing live. I'm Mr. King Dots. I'm the gamest in the land. I never play nice. I'm the devil's right hand man. I can't so yeah, she's just amazingly talented, really gives the performance a whole lot of soul and it really stands out this is like really one of the only vocal songs tracks in the game outside of you know the barbershop quartet ones but i mean this this song die house is really inspired by cab calloway Minnie the moocher i mean like that's clearly in the inspiration taken from that uh but man like i had to had to put this here it's it's really just a prominent performance you cert- it certainly blew my mind yeah Damn. <laughs> All right. It's, it's just fantastic. And because we're talking about King Dice, we have to go to King Dice's boss battle theme. This is the King's Court. So King Dice is the boss of the All Bets Are Off level in Inkwell Hell. It's the penultimate level, uh, and you're kind of having like a board game, which is almost like Gunstar Heroes-like, against a bunch of minions. There's like eight mini-bosses that you can fight up against. Uh, And then there's the main fight against King Dice with like card-based attacks. Uh, It's kind of like, you know, before you face the devil, take on, on King Dice. But I say this is like the absolute definitive Cuphead track. Like, these wailing trumpets right at the beginning, the sax support. Like, you hear this song, this opening riff, like, there is no question what this song is from. Like, it's Cuphead through and through. It's this perfect, hectic pace for a really tense battle. And if I remember correctly, yeah, like, parts of Die House are in this song. As well, they should be. Because, again, King Dice. But, like, there are little bits of it that you hear every once in a while. Mm Mm-hmm. And they really, really make the track for me. That's the part that really makes the track. Yeah, it's a fantastic, fantastic piece. <laughs> yeah, so like if I had to just you know pick one and say like, here, this is Cuphead's soundtrack, it would be The King's Court. It's just so very good. Couple tracks on the cutting room floor for me, though. I'll start with Inkwell Isle 1. <laughs> So 
something totally different. Just a, a happy ragtime level one overworld kind of vibe. It's just a positive little march. It's it's very Disney like in that sort of sense. But as you get to learn this game, like this is your this is your overworld theme for the first island, and you become very familiar with it. It's it's pretty representative of that kind of starting out sort of feeling. But then for another boss battle, I'm gonna go with High Seas Hijinks. And a lot of people like this boss battle. I don't blame them. It's against uh, Kala Maria. She's the boss of this uh, level in Isle 3. And she's this this thick mermaid. And boy, oh boy, uh, she, she's quite the looker. Uh, let's go baritone sax. Killing it on this track. Loving that. There's bias here. I, I'm just saying, like, <laughs> you don't see too many baritone saxes killing it with a uh, solo play, so uh, it's it's really a standout. I mean, a lot of people love this level, this this boss battle, and the music kind of goes hand in hand with it. I just had to had to mention it. Just wouldn't be on what I'd say would be the the critical five here. I got two. One of them is the song "Threatening Zeppelin." Oh, just another classic boss battle for sure. Well, also, what am I supposed to do? Not include some hot xylophone action? Come on. Yeah. Come on. You gotta do that. I mean, you get, you get some piano, you get some xylophone. I mean, all sorts of jazz instruments get their time to shine with solos uh, throughout this soundtrack. And it's it's just really cool to hear. But yeah, I mean, xylophone. The this, this one, I think, maybe has like, feels like the most transitions. Ending mm -hmm. with that famous... Big Crescent Moon. I mean, that's that's a classic, classic boss battle early on in Cuphead. And the other being Railroad Wrath. Because A... I think it's really cool that the song, like, goes out of its way to sound like a train. Like, the percussion sounds like one, and you've got the, the trumpets, the muted trumpets, making the... Absolutely, yeah. But also, this boss fight is a reference to the ghost train from Final Fantasy VI, and if that's not the coolest thing, I don't know what is. That's also one of the interesting things about Cup is, yeah, as you said, like, all the references that come across. I mean, there's there's this boss battle with with two frogs, and they're like specifically meant to be references to Ryu and Ken from Street Fighter. They throw a Hadoken. Yeah. There's there's a boss that's with a dragon that is explicitly supposed to be a reference to the dragon boss from Mega Man 2. Yes. Yeah, and it got, that's one of the harder bosses in the game for sure. Uh, so yeah, that's... Just all the different little references in there. They're certainly intentional. Uh, though I think they said one that is, uh, it was like there's a, a bee, uh, sort of queen bee sort of battle. And some people were like, oh, it's a lot like uh, Queen Sectonia from Kirby Triple Deluxe. And they're like, of all the references that we put in this <laughs> game, that one is purely intentional or just you know coincidental. Like that's not meant to be one. <laughs> What will I never forget about this game? It's mostly just how hard it is. Like it's one that I really have to get back to and and try again. Like, it's, but it's so hard. But no game looks like it. It's it's just has this own unique style, and it blows my mind that someone with zero composing experience, especially for games, has to go and learn about how to do so from scratch, and comes up with this. This amazing gem of a jazz soundtrack. I can't believe it. It's just fantastic. Yeah, what am I supposed to do with my life now, Mr. Madigan? <laughs> I can't do... You... This is your first? This is your first go? First and only? <laughs> what, am, what am I supposed to do with that information? 
<laughs> it's a, it's incredible. It's I I didn't react when you told me it, but like because you told me that ahead of time. Because sometimes while researching, we'll find something out that's like so so what that we have to go tell the other person yeah, before yeah. the show, and I didn't like react in chat. But when you told me this, I think yesterday, I was like, no, it's not. No, it. You're. he's lying. He is. Li- I believe he's lying. This was not his first. This couldn't be. It's, it's just incredible. Yeah. It, he did such a fantastic job. I mean, and both these composers. I mean, Jake Kaufman, I could listen to hours and hours and hours of his music. And for jazz, I'm just a big jazz fan. So... This this work by Christopher Madigan is inspiring. So, you know, for two 2D platforming uh, games just with totally different objectives and totally different uh, sort of themes and looks to them, uh, it's it's a good good week for this show as far as what we're covering. And I'm, I'm really glad we did. I, I agree. I think that uh, these two games needed some highlighting. And, I mean... Cuphead, I feel like a lot of people remember like Cuphead especially. Oh man, look at the look at those graphics, that animation. And granted, boy howdy does it deserve that attention for that. Hand drawn animation in this day and age in a video game? They don't even do that for movies anymore. <laughs> right. But like I I kind of feel like sometimes the the soundtrack gets a little bit glazed over, not fully. But a little bit, and I I think it's it's good to sort of throw a little bit of a spotlight over Mr. Madigan and his one-time success. <laughs> First try. But absolutely go buy Cuphead on Nintendo Switch. I'm certainly tempted to uh to buy Shantae and the Pirate's Curse on Nintendo Switch. That sounds like a good playing game for sure. But that'll do it for this week on Original Sound Chat. You can find me on Twitter at Pete Speakeasy. Joe is over at The Dobaga. The video version of Original Sound Chat is over on the Rhymes with Asia YouTube channel. But the podcast version is over on Anonymous Dinosaur at anondino.squarespace.com. Of course, please find the podcast version on Apple Podcasts, Google Play. Download those MP3s. Bring it in your ears, in your cars, at work. We won't tell your bosses, don't worry. Uh, But check us out there, and please subscribe, leave reviews, feedback, all that good stuff. Uh, And check out our other shows as well. Joe does the Smasher Pieces podcast, where you're playing video games that are inspired by Super Smash Brothers characters. And then uh, I do the show called The Power Switch, which is gaming's call and talk radio show, kind of recapping the week in games and giving you an opportunity to call in and contribute and be on a podcast yourself. Uh, but the social media for Original Sound Chat is over at Sound Chat OST. Please leave feedback for us. Uh, just tell us how we're doing, what you'd like to see improve, but also games you'd like to see us cover. And on, on iTunes and Google Play, throw some ratings and reviews our way. We'd really love to see those. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Really, really do appreciate that. So to play us out, I'll uh, you know, highlight a cover of a Cuphead song from YouTube this time around. Uh, this is from Rashad E.B. And so he does a metal cover of you know, different Cuphead songs. Uh, I gotta throw a shout out to Floral Fury uh, just because of how different it is with its samba feel. But translating it into a metal cover sounds even better uh, just as far as a unique take on it. So here's his cover. Thanks so much for listening. Really appreciate you listening. I'll do it for this week. Take care. <laughs>